Hello, I'm Max Prescott, and this is the YouTube version of my top-ranked aviation news talk podcast, a weekly show with news and tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm the author of several books and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. Today, we're talking about a tragic midair that occurred at the Watsonville, California airport, where a Cessna 340 on a straight-in approach collided with a Cessna 152 that had just turned final. The airport's just 30 miles from me, and I fly into it once or twice a week. I'll talk not only about the crash, but about things the pilots might have done differently to avoid the crash. If you want to learn more about avoiding midair and near midair collisions in general, check out episode 109 of the Aviation News Talk podcast. Now, please hit subscribe so you don't miss future shows. And now here's our show. There are many interesting aspects to this crash, but the most salient fact is that the twin Cessna 340, which flew along straight into runway 20, was flying at very high speed. And while both planes made all of the recommended radio transmissions, at least one of the final radio calls was ambiguous about the aircraft's position. Let's focus first on the twin Cessna 340. This aircraft often flew into Watsonville on weekends, and the prior weekend its final approach speed was around 100 knots. But on the day of the accident, the twin was still at about 180 knots when it hit the Cessna 152 on short final. However, the landing gear extension speed for this aircraft is 140 knots. That suggests that either the pilot forgot to put down the landing gear or he had the gear down and was vastly overspeeding the gear limits. We'll probably never know why the 340 was flying so fast, but in this case that extra speed was a significant factor in the accident. Communications were also an issue. Both pilots were communicating in the ways that they were supposed to, but both could have done a better job, as I'll explain when I play the radio communications. First, here's some background on the airport. Watsonville is a very busy airport located next to the Monterey Bay. It has two intersecting runways. Runway 20 points at the ocean, and that runway is probably used 95% of the time. There's a crossing runway, runways 9 and 27, which are rarely used. The airport field elevation is about 160 feet, so it's close to sea level. Although Watsonville is a very busy airport, it's non-towered, meaning pilots need to communicate their position to each other over the radio as they prepare to take off and land. To me, the airport seems busier than Salinas, a nearby towered airport with longer runways and an ILS, which is perhaps why it has the tower. I've often said the tower at Salinas should be moved to Watsonville since there's seemingly more traffic there. And having a tower could have helped to avoid this accident. About 8 miles east of the airport is a ridge that goes up to 2,000 feet, so aircraft that make the long straight and approach to runway 20 have to first clear that ridge before starting their descent. And when you're flying a fast airplane, it's hard to both descend and slow up at the same time without making a huge power reduction, which may be hard on the engines. So it pays to reduce power and slow up before you start a steep descent. Here's some ground tracks and airspeeds for the twin, provided courtesy of ADSBExchange.com. The first one shows their approach to Watsonville two weeks earlier on August 6th. As you can see, the aircraft crossed the ridge at about 2,500 feet and had already slowed to 150 knots. At 675 feet MSL, about 500 feet above the ground, the aircraft had slowed to 100 knots. Now, these are all ground speeds, so they are affected by the winds aloft, though in the summertime, the winds are generally fairly light in this area, so these ground speeds are probably a good representation of the aircraft's true airspeed. Here's the approach to Watsonville one week earlier on August 12th. Here the aircraft crossed the ridge a little higher at about 2,800 feet, but the plane had already slowed to 120 knots. At 850 feet MSL, 700 feet above the ground, it had slowed to 100 knots. And here's the approach to Watsonville on August 18th, the day of the accident. Here the aircraft crossed the ridge a little higher at 2,650 feet, but the plane was still at 197 knots, 50 and 80 knots faster respectively than the prior two approaches. At 850 feet MSL, 700 feet above the ground, the plane was still at 181 knots, 80 knots faster than it was at this point on the prior two approaches. The airplane continued to descend and was still doing 181 knots at 375 feet MSL at the approximate point where the two aircraft collided. The normal approach speed for a Cessna 152 on final is 55 to 65 knots, so the twin was going 120 knots faster than the aircraft in front of it. Now what's really hard to understand is why the pilot of the twin continued to fly an approach to landing at 180 knots when it would have been almost impossible to land at that speed. Yet the data shows a continual descent to about 200 feet AGL where the airplanes collided and the pilot of the twin never gave any indication that he planned to do anything other than land straight in for a full stop. 
Now, perhaps the pilot was distracted as he didn't reference other aircraft in the traffic pattern until he was about a mile from the airport. Let's talk now about the other aircraft, November 49931, a Cessna 152 that was in the traffic pattern, flying left traffic to runway 20. I went back 25 minutes in the audio, and you could hear the pilot regularly report his position on crosswind, downwind, base, and final. At the time of the accident, the 152 was on at least its fifth landing and was making touch and goes as after each landing, he reported that he was on the go, meaning that he was climbing out after his landing. About a minute before the accident, a Cessna 182 November 419 Bravo Echo, which was flying a practice instrument approach into Watsonville, flew over the airport at about 1,300 feet. Four minutes later, after they returned to the NorCal approach frequency, NorCal inquired about a possible accident at Watsonville, and here's the exchange that they had, which describes the accident well. Bravo Echo, if you hear anything on do you hear anything on uh, CTAF? We heard there was a the crash at Watsonville just now, a twin Cessna. Uh, it was a twin Cessna and a single engine Cessna. Um, uh, it looks like both of them went down 30 yards. You said it was two aircraft? Uh, for a minute, I, from what it looks like, it was uh, a 172 or a single engine Cessna and then a twin Cessna. There were Bravo Echo, so it seemed like they crashed into each other? Yeah, the uh, twin Cessna was on a long final approach, and somebody else was on base turning final, and uh, the final approach, the twin engine Cessna didn't see him, and uh, he crashed into him, the, twin, the single engine Cessna went down, and the twin engine uh, rolled into the ground. Number nine, Bravo Echo, thank you. Now let's listen to the radio calls of the twin Cessna, November 740 Whiskey Juliet, and the Cessna 150 931 in the last few minutes leading up to the accident. The twin made its first call at 10 miles from the airport, while the 152 was just turning left cross one at the opposite end of the traffic pattern. Technically, both aircraft made all of the appropriate radio calls. However, the twin was late to inquire about the aircraft on base, and the 152 was a little ambiguous when reporting his position when he told the twin that it was behind the 152. Here's the radio exchange. Traffic, twin Cessna 740, Whiskey Jewel is 10 miles east. Presently, we're at 4500. Uh, after the last ridge, we'll descend for a straight in for 20, Watsonville. Watsonville traffic, Niners here, Fox Trot Lima is turning a uh, one and a half mile left base from a 20, Watsonville. Watsonville traffic, Cessna 931, left cross, 120, Watsonville. Traffic 2 to Hotel, off the active 2-0, Watsonville. Watsonville traffic, Cessna 9031, turning left downwind 2-0, Watsonville. Watsonville area traffic, twin Cessna 740, which could you at three miles straight in, two zero, full stop, Watsonville. Uh, Watsonville traffic, Cessna 931, in left base, two zero, Watsonville. Uh, what's up with the any comp? Is the truck on uh, frequency? Watsonville area traffic, twin Cessna 740, Whiskey Juliet, one mile, uh, straight in, two zero, full stop. Looking for traffic on left base. Yeah, I see you. You're, uh, you're behind me. I'm going to go around then because you're coming at me pretty quick, man. Or zero Fox Trot, uh, that is zero Fox Trot Lima is at the left cross left for room 20, uh, Watsonville. Everybody, please be advised there is an accident towards uh, runway 20. Please be advised, Watsonville. Uh, 
everybody, please be advised on airport Watsonville. We have a couple of accidents. Please be advised, Watsonville. Let's analyze this further. Typically, an aircraft on base would join the final at about one and a half miles from the airport. Yet the twin didn't inquire about the position of the 152 until it was on a one-mile final. At that point, it was very late to ask that question, as an aircraft on base could be expected to turn on final a mile and a half before the runway, and the twin had already passed that point. Also, the 152 pilot's decision to turn base after hearing the twin was on a three-mile final was questionable, and the pilot knew it might be close. He actually turned onto base about three-tenths of a mile sooner than he did on his prior circuits around the pattern. And the 152's radio call that, you are behind me, was ambiguous. Did that mean that the aircraft was still on base and that he was closer to the airport than the twin? Or did it mean that the 152 was on final and that the twin was coming up rapidly behind him on final? If I were flying the 152 and I were on final, I would have said something like, I'm on short final coming up on the road at 300 feet. Or if he was still on base, I might have said, I'm still on base and I'm going to turn back to the downwind to follow you in. As you can see, at critical moments, the words you use have to clearly convey your exact position and your intentions. When the 152 said that he was going to go around, he was apparently on short final, though the twin may have thought that the 152 was still on base. As part of the go-around, the 152 undoubtedly started to climb and may have climbed up into the Cessna 340, but the pilot of the twin apparently did see the 152 at the very last second. According to a story in the Santa Cruz Sentinel, a witness who was driving past the airport saw the twin-engine aircraft bank hard to the right and hit the wing of the smaller aircraft, which he said just spiraled down and crashed near the edge of the airfield. Throughout the entire process, the twin never initiated a climb. Data shows that the twin managed to stay in the air for about six-tenths of a mile, paralleling the runway and slowing to 132 knots before it entered a left turn, crossed over the runway, and crashed into the end of a row of hangars. The second hangar in from the end belongs to a client of mine, and he's already heard from the city that his hangar was hit as well. Both pilots showed questionable judgment. One possible explanation comes from an NTSB study that shows that 40% of pilots involved in fatal accidents tested positive for either over-the-counter, prescription, or illicit drugs. The most common potentially impairing drug pilots had used was a sedating antihistamine that's an active ingredient in many over-the-counter allergy formulations, cold medicines, and sleep aids. Toxicology tests should eventually tell us whether one or both pilots were possibly impaired. So in summary, there were many factors involved in this accident, and if any one of them had been different, this accident might have been avoided. If the twin had flown its normal slower approach, there would have been more time for it to look for traffic. The FAA's AC90-66B, non-towered airport flight operations, says, quote, entry to the downward leg should be at a 45-degree angle of beam the midpoint of the runway to be used for the landing. So straight-in landings are not the usual way to enter the traffic pattern at a non-towered airport. Regarding straighted landings, the AC says that pilots should, quote, clearly communicate on the CTAF and coordinate maneuvering for an execution of the landing with other traffic so as not to disrupt the flow of other aircraft. Yet the pilot of the twin was late to inquire about traffic in the regular traffic pattern. And if the 152 was still on base when he spotted the twin, a better choice might have been to return to the downwind. Regardless, both pilots could have done a little better job in their final transmissions of communicating their position and their intentions. Thanks for watching, and if you listen to podcasts, please subscribe to the Aviation News Talk podcast in whatever podcast player you use.